Right, it looks like uh, the next speaker will be Steve Rosenfeld. Steve Rosenfeld. Uh, and as he comes up to make sure people have uh, enough time, uh, Steve Rosenfeld uh, played a significant role in the development of uh, this movement. I, I know personally, not only did he uh, uh, co-write books with me and really uh, co-wrote and did most of the writing on the best one, he also was the man, because of his connections in radio with Air America, uh, that raised over $120,000 that allowed the Ohio election challenge, the Moss v. Bush, to go forward. Uh, he really uh, doesn't emphasize that, but this is the guy that created the lawsuit, my good friend, Steve Rosenfeld. Wow. Well, thank you all very much. And thank you, Bob. That was really nice. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, there are so many people in this crowd who have been at this for a long time. And that, by that, I mean digging into the crevices of voting and elections. And um, while this conference mostly focuses on the final stages in this process, counting and verifying the vote, um, and what are the dangers related to moving to internet voting, um, my role is a little different. It's to provide a counterpoint to where we are on what's happening before that final stage, the counting and ascertaining who won. So after covering the recount last fall, um, I was prompted or urged or convinced to write a book <laughs> about the anti-democratic features we saw in 2016. And um, many of them are not new. And many of them go back to um, things that have happened earlier this decade. But we know a lot more now than we did in 2004 when Bob and I first got involved in cataloging what happened in Ohio. And a lot of people in this room got involved in tracking the exit polls and, uh, and Unlike then, we can quantify, not infer, quantify the impact of these tactics and trends on voters. So this, I think this matters because we need to know what's most injurious. Because everyone in this room, <laughs> and I've been guilty of this too, will, will argue that this is the most important thing. This is the most important thing. <laughs> and uh, I won't drop names. But... <laughs> Everything is important, and everything especially matters in low turnout elections. And nationally, the Republicans know this. They know this more than the Democrats. They know this more than the Bernie Krats. And for this past decade, they have effectively gamed and manipulated the rules in, I would say, shrewd, selfish, and immoral ways, but they have been incredibly effective. So what am I referring to? I'll just talk about a couple of these foundational features. We have gerrymandered political districts. We have registration obstacles. We have fewer ballot casting options. We have paperwork and identification requirements aimed at new voters and people going to the polls, not by voting by mail. And they do this because they never know what's the, going to be the final swing district in the final swing counties in the final swing states. So they cast wide nets, and they're deliberately crude, and it's shrewd, and it works. So, um, so, so, but what we know now in 2017 how impactful some of these tactics are. And what I mean by that is how much they advantage one side in the percentage of reported votes when the votes are counted. This has been studied by academics, congressional researchers, cited in court cases. So here are the biggest ones. And I'll talk a little bit after this about what happened in the Democratic primary with Bernie. But, but what the Democrats have done in their own anti-democratic ways pales next to the GOP. It is not on a national scale. So redistricting, which was before the Supreme Court this week, what is it? It's segregating reliable voters when creating political districts. So we had the recount states, states where the final count was 10,000, 11,000, 24,000, 50,000, and then you have these districts, state legislative districts, and you have their congressional delegations that are two-thirds red. How does that happen? Segregating reliable voters. So data geeks 
not me, <laughs> but people at 538.com, The Cook Report, David Daly, they looked at the Republicans' last gerrymander in 2011, because that's when it happens. It's the last of this decade. And they have found that the Republicans in these gerrymandered districts have a six to eight point percentage advantage, starting line advantage. In the, these are six to eight points in the number of reliable voters that are likely to cast ballots in November. And um, the Supreme Court, which had a, a they had these, they used the exact same numbers when they made, issued their decision last November, excuse me, this spring, about North Carolina. They found that GOP House members routinely won with 56% of the vote, where Democrats won with 69, 70%. So this is not voter suppression, this is structural rigging. And it sets the stage before campaigns, candidates, debates happen. And this is a giant hurdle. And there's more to this, that only giant turnout waves can breach. And of course, this, this is not every state, but these are the states that matter in national elections and determine national power. Not California, I'm sorry to say, but Florida, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, Texas, more. So the next one is Strict vote, stricter voter ID requirement, requirements to get a ballot. Again, this is not blue state America, but there are new numbers that have come out in the past year. So you have studies by con congressional analysts, academics, that say stricter voter ID blocks two to three points off of turnout in November. But you have new studies that say the numbers are more than double that for non-white voting, you know, voting communities. So you take this together, the extreme gerrymandering and stricter voter ID, and you've got a 10 percentage point starting line advantage. So when people talk about, we're gonna kick butt in 2018, just remember that. Where are you gonna find the races and the candidates that are gonna have that much support? Because that's how high the wall is. And there's more, there's more to this. So there's new stuff also happening in the voter purge department. Now, the, 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 there are legitimate reasons to take people off of voter rolls because people move and people die. And usually when people move and they die, they don't tell their local election offices that they've moved or they've died. And you want to have accurate voter lists for campaigns and candidates. And, but what should be a straightforward bookkeeping process has been totally hijacked in the most po politicized of ways. And there's new stuff happening with this. So first, in Bob State, Ohio, there, the other big voting rights case before the Supreme Court this fall concerns what his Republican Secretary of State did. They found an ambiguity in the motor voter laws, the National Voter Registration Act of 1993, that says, you can move people, off, take people off the list if they haven't voted for two federal cycles, four years. But then it also says you can't remove inactive voters. Now, this is what we really have to pay attention to, because what the Republicans are increasingly doing is they are zeroing in on these ambiguities in election law, and they are throwing the first punch, and then they're going to court to litigate. So what do they do in Ohio? Well, they aggress under John Husted, Hundreds of thousands of voters were taken off disproportionately in the blue urban epicenters. And this was caught, not by me at Alternet or by Bob at the Free Press. This was caught by Reuters, and the voting rights activists sued. And this is the other big case before the Supreme Court this fall. And it's almost hard to put a percentage on what the impact of this is because it's so subterranean. But we, uh, unlike you know, the mathematics around voter ID, and redistricting. So there's an, another thing about this, um, ab about this tactic of seizing on legal ambiguities that we really have to pay attention to. Um, we know how accurate data mining is when we're on Facebook and Google. You know, you cannot go to another web page without seeing an ad for what you just looked at. Everybody knows this. But when it comes to elections, the opposite is happening. We have this trend where bad data with known error rates is being used to create hundreds of thousands of false positives in the process of validating voter registrations. And this is not just Chris Kobach and Crosscheck. Um, this is bigger than that.
So you have states like Georgia, which should be a purple state and could tilt the balance nationally, where the Republican Secretary of State, who's now running for governor, he is not just prosecuting people who, and he is doing this, who for, voter, for their voter registration drives, turning in forms of errors. They throw, he th deliberately throws partial social security numbers, not all nine digits, motor vehicle records with known typos, state prisoner records into a digital blender to try to va verify someone's ID on a voter registration form. He has gotten hundreds of thousands of false positives. He has held up tens of thousands of registrations from people who, who amazingly always get approved, but not in the election they want to vote in, they register to vote in. This is what's going on now. And so you have this epidemic of false positives. And I should just say, the Social Security, Congress, their analysts have shown that the error rates in Social Security databases, DMV databases, and yet this is all being thrown in there and coming up with these false positives. So now, Chris Kobach, for, you, for those of you who don't know him, he's the Kansas Secretary of State. He runs an interstate program called Crosscheck that looks for duplicate registrations. Under the expectation he's gonna find proof of double voting, it's not. And what he is doing, he, and he was appointed by Trump to uh, be the co-chair of this Election Integrity Commission. And even though that commission has been derided as being utterly clownish, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. You've got people on that commission who destroyed the voting section under George W. Bush, Hans von Spakovsky, who wants to take, add things like jury lists to see if people who got out of jury duty somehow lied about their voter registration forms. This is this, more bad matching. But this is their next big thing. They want to include paper proof of citizenship. What does that mean? It means, you know, birth certificates or passports or immigration papers to, to, on top of the signature oath that your voter registration form is honest. And they're obsessing on this. And they've implemented this in a couple of states. And it's separate and unequal rules for voting in state elections. And why? 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 So we're talking about the numbers. Because, as the Brennan Center at New York's NYU Law School says, 7% of eligible voters don't have the proof. So you got 6%, 6 to 8% of a built-in advantage on redistricting, 2 to 3 points in November with stricter voter ID and more in the primaries. And they're looking at something to add another 7. So this is the big picture when you're looking at 2018 and 2020. And this all comes before the stuff that most people here are gonna talk about, which is, can we accurately count the vote? Now, I, I will digress for a minute, because I know people in this room might wanna th think about what happened to Bernie. So I had a very long and very revealing conversation with the fellow who was his top political consultant on the campaign and, and their liaison to the DNC. And he didn't want his name used in the book. <laughs> And he said that beyond all the DNC stuff where they were all in for Hillary, what I mean by that is the lack of debates that they scheduled, all the stuff that came out of WikiLeaks, all that stuff, he said there are these layers of institutional and cultural inertia that don't always necessarily have anti-democratic intentions, but they have anti-democratic results. Exhibit A are the caucuses. These citizen-run caucuses are so unprofessional and their stakes are too high. And they'll, they'll, for people in this room, th there's one singular feature to note. They don't release the raw vote totals. The Des Moines Register said Bernie won, but they couldn't prove it, and they, and they couldn't prove it. And I'll go on from there. And, and then, then there's also like the resistance in the party to why people won't change things because they've always done things the way they've done things. And that takes you to a place like California, where we are here, where they have superdelegates too. And that stopped a Bernie craft from winning a state chair. Okay, and then we have election officials, and I won't, and it's not every election official, but he, Bernie encountered a lot of sloppy election administration that also degraded his numbers. We never got enough proof, in my view, to figure out if he would have won certain states, where we think he would have certainly have done better. But all of this is adding layer of layer of injury on top of um, what should be the right of people to have their votes counted and, and count, cast and counted fairly. 
So that's, um, and what I just want to leave you with, and I'll, I'll stop here because this is probably enough, um, is if you look at every way the system up to the point that we are here to talk about, you guys mostly on the counting and the verifying, it has been targeted and gamed in the most intricate and Byzantine ways by people who, by the Republicans mostly, nation, nationwide. So why would that stop when it magically comes to counting the votes or developing new election systems to replace you know, what we have now? There's, and so I know some of you are working on this, you know, to, to try to change that. And, and of course, I hope you're all successful. But this is the landscape we face from start to finish, every point along the way where it really matters. You see things that preempt voters, preempt vote counting, preempt what we would hope would be free and fair. So thank you. Stick around for questions. All right, we got time for questions. I'd urge those that are watching out there, go to the website nvrtf.org. If you like what you're hearing and want to support it, go there, get information, uh, and send donations. All right, uh, first question looks like uh, Jonathan Simon. Go ahead. Thanks, Steve. Um, you know, it, it, just to comment on that, it, it, if you govern uh, sufficiently abysmally, you're going to need many, many, many thumbs on the scale to, uh, to pull out victories in, in democracy. And one thing that you didn't mention and that's been chilling me for quite a while is the fact that they, uh, the Republicans have uh, the power in these trifecta states to effectively gerrymander the presidency um, by apportioning electoral votes according to uh, congressional district, which is already done in Maine, it's already done in Nebraska, and it's certainly constitutional as the Constitution is now written. Do you have any sense about where that might be going? Because if that actually, if they do pursue that uh, line of attack, uh, you, you know, the bad will get uh, far worse and you won't see another Democratic president in our lifetime. Well, yes, well, first, first of all, I want to just say, Jonathan was the person who put us made us aware of exit poll discrepancies starting in 2004. So we, um, you know, and so we, we need to, you know, acknowledge and thank that. Yeah, it, what, it, what you're pointing to is, is really real. And this is, this is something that is not, this is something that Alec, the American Legislative Exchange Council funded by the Koch brothers, has been pushing for years. And, and this, this threat is not, it's not speculative. You have almost a threshold number of states calling for Article 5 constitutional convention, mostly red states. This is on, would be on the table there. You have other people, I dare say, Larry Lessig, are you kidding me? Who is now also pushing for stuff out there to, so that, because he believes it would be a, you know, so you would basically apportion the ele electors by congressional districts. It's, it's not, it's not good, and um, I, I, I won't go on, I'll just take the next question, but Jonathan is right, it's, it's, it's a serious threat, and as the Republicans get more desperate, and as the American demography goes against them, because we have a more diverse country, they're going to resort to more desperate measures. So I have a similar question to the last person. So you make an extremely compelling case, and uh, what I take away from that is basically we're screwed. So. What do you suggest we, as ordinary citizens, do to combat any of those things that really seem insurmountable? Well, I, I don't. I think that um, I'm not as optimistic as I would like to be. Let's just put it that way. Um, I think what matters most in 2018 are the governor's races, more than taking back Congress. It, it, right now, Congress is stuck and is not doing too much. The bad stuff's about to come from the executive branch. But unless we have somebody who can potentially veto these bad maps, we're going to be living with these same political cultures that gave us these gerrymandered states and super, red state supermajorities until the decade of the 2030s. Because there's no way that they're, they're, going, to, that they're going to lose those supermajorities between now and, and 2020. Is it, is it going to happen in Ohio, Bobby? <laughs> okay, so, 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 um, so the thing is, you, we have to focus on what is most important. And this is what's so hard, because every single one of us gets 10 emails a day telling us this is the crisis, we need to contribute, we need to do this, we need to do that. It all matters, but some stuff matters more than others. 
And I, I would contend. And I would say when it comes to 2018 elections, at least you have somebody with a veto pen when the bad maps are drawn. And that may not, they may still go back as they do now after ordered by courts and draw up more bad maps, but it's quicker to have a veto pen than going back to court. And that's about the best I think we can do. Hello. Um, at the outset, um, you said that we were headed toward internet voting. And that really gives me pause because people who build computers say that today's chips are so dense that unless somebody who programs them deliberately indexes them, there is no way to discern every program that is resident on them. They can have Trojan horses, they can have sleepovers, they can have backdoor entries for software engineers. Georgia reported 23,000 um, machines, programmable devices in their recent election. How would we ever police the equipment involved in internet voting, and why should we go that way instead of taking the vote back into our own hands and counting it ourselves as Germany and France and other smart democracies do? Well, I could not agree with you more. And I would say that, to be honest, I'm not the best. You have people in this room who are going to be speaking after me and speaking tomorrow who will be able to give you detailed answers on the spectrum of, of, of that. And it, it, it would not be right for me to even try to, to answer that, but because you have people here who really know what's going on and can really say a lot more and better than I. But it's, it seems pretty clear that the standard needs to be paper ballots, and, and, and if they're gonna be scanned, which they are gonna be scanned, because we have a <laughs> we have a country of 140 million people who vote in presidential elections. They have to be considered public documents so people like John Brakey, who's in the back of the room here, can tell us how you can do, you know, citizen-led audits. And, and, you know, and the thing is, stick around and, and hear these people, because some people, like, like what John will have to say and, and what Barbara Simon will say a little bit later this morning, I'm sure will touch on this much better than I can. I completely agree with you. And you know what? And we face the same stuff with our health care. California couldn't, we're, we are a super majority blue state. And, and so yes, and so maybe that suggests that we need to focus locally and statewide where in our states because as you, that is the building blocks. Elections are run at the state level. So um, you kind of introduced me before when you were talking about those people that don't know all of the stuff that's going on. That's me. So um, when you have those gerrymandering maps, when they put those up, you can tell that they're not right because they'll be like a regular size and then this little chunk will be all the way out and then they'll come back up, right? So it doesn't look right, but when you start talking about data points, that's when I believe you're saying why technically that doesn't look right, something. But is it gerrymandering because, because of the exclusion of the reliable voters because they know okay. who uh, goes to vote. So okay. one moment, so the finish is, yep. so the attack is on turnout motivations? No, let me, let, 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 okay, let me, let me tell you, let, let me, I, there's so much in all this stuff and so much background, so excuse me if I compress too much. What happens with gerrymandering? What's, what, okay, Obama won big in 2008 and he had a lock on the Congress and he, and he had the presidency. So a Republican strategist who specialized in state elections got very smart. And he thought, you know, if we can take over and win enough majorities in enough state houses across the country, we can, we can draw these maps. So with Karl Rove's help, they ran some of the nastiest ads ever seen in local political campaigns in 2010. And, and as a result, they got to sit at the table and this here's what they did. They got their butts kicked in 2008. So they looked at who were the Republican voters that turned out, and they drew districts where they knew that the people who voted for John McCain would actually amount to at least 
of the reliable voters in those districts for, for, for state legislative office and, con and Congress, and then they packed the Democrats into clusters where they were going to win anyway, but they weren't going to win by 54%, they are going to win with 70%. And so, at, so right now, the Supreme, yes. Will win, people will go out and vote? They know they will win, they, they're likely to win because these are people who reliably vote. And, the, the, and, and if you think about this for a second, the Democrats hope to, Register voters and new people with the expectation and hope they will turn out. The Republicans, they, they don't want to be that optimistic. They want people that are proven in shitty years. And that's what they did. And Obama didn't stop them, and Nancy Pelosi didn't stop them, and that's why we've had the House this. And the, the, and, and the Supreme Court case is, is excessive partisanship like this legal? That is the question. Thank you. I'd like to focus not so much on kind of the small stuff that you've been talking about, but try to expand and really look at the big picture. For example, let's get rid of battleground states and vote the presidency with a national popular vote. Yes. Let's, let's get rid of gerrymandering by endorsing and talking and advocating for proportional representation that doesn't depend on slicing and dicing members into single member districts. Thank you. Well, you're right. You're correct, you're right. And the thing is, there are answers to do how to do everything like this. The question is, how do we make them happen? How do we get them written into law? Last question. Hi, uh, Bill Simpich. I'm with the Show Us the Ballot campaign here in California. My question is, I don't understand why more state uh, organizations aren't putting up candidates for Secretary of State. It seems like the ideal platform for raising election integrity issues. Have you seen it in other states? Any thoughts about the wisdom of that approach? Well, gee, I think, yes. I, you, know, you know, Becky Bond, before she went, left Credo to work, and then to work for Bernie, she had the Secretary of State project, and they were we were tr she was trying to find and recruit candidates. And you're absolutely right. And I think that in California, what we face is a, um, we have, a, we, have a, a, we have a Democratic Party that has a lock on leadership that's very entrenched and they're very resistant, you know, and they have their line of insiders and they're just like, it was Hillary's turn. So, and, and, and they know who gets put on the ballot as a Democrat, even though we have our top two. So, but, but you know, you're right, they're, you're right. Don't you think an election integrity candidate could make the top two for November? If the word got out. Thank you. I'm ready for Secretary of State. I feel like I'm going up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, take a look at him. Put the cameras on him. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Steve uh, uh, Rosenfeld.